Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. Given the tumultuous events of recent weeks in the Middle East and Russian advances in Ukraine, we return to the topic of geopolitics. The world around us is getting ever more uncertain and, dare I say it, unsafe. What are the main concerns and what impact could they have on energy markets in Europe? I'm Richard Sverson, and helping me to discuss the ramifications of the current geopolitical situation and uncertainties are Tobias Federico of Montel Analytics and Wayne Bryan of London Stock Exchange Group, or LSEG for short. A warm welcome to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Good to see you again. Good to have you back, Wayne. Now, um, uh, I want, just to, before we get into the geopolitics, I just want to talk about where we are in the market and, and, and the fundamental situation. Where, 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 in terms of wholesale gas prices, Wayne, where are we? Well, what we saw was over recent weeks, we saw that geopolitical influence in terms of prices. Sorry, in terms of prices. Prices were heading towards that sort of 23 euro support line. And of course, we had that, you know, say trifecta, if not more, of, of news outbreaks, mostly geopolitical, that really sent us back up. But what we've seen over the last probably few days is a kind of return to fundamentals. We've seen some easing of the geopolitical risk premiums. And what we see now is gas markets returning more to fundamentals, which for this summer are quite bearish. Mm. Well, what's your view, Tobias? I mean, uh, uh, lower gas prices are driving power prices down, right? Well, absolutely. Gas prices and CO2 emission prices are the main price drivers right now. It's gas prices. And we really saw an upward trend in the electricity markets. Uh, we came from 70 euro reach. We reached almost 100. We didn't really hit them. Mm. But now it also came down uh, parallel to the gas prices. And, you know, we're, we're ahead of the summer, you know, uh, you know it's, it feels bitterly cold at the moment. But, uh, you know, I think prices are, are going to remain in this level, would you say, for the, for the coming weeks and months? Well, we are speaking about a year ahead contracts. Mm -hmm. So the current weather really doesn't impact that. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, you see always a correlation between spot market prices and year ahead prices, even though at least in the power market and the gas market is different, uh, different. But in the power market, you see it has no fundamental impact, but it has a psychological impact. Sure, absolutely. And uh, demand, uh, Wayne, we, you know, we hear on almost on a weekly basis uh, stories of demand destruction, industry uh, potentially thinking about relocating. Um, would it be fair to say that demand has fallen by 20% since pre-COVID levels? Depend on your metrics, <clears throat> it's around that level. So we model demand destruction in both uh, LDZ slash residential uh, and also in the industrial sector. And what we've noted is, firstly, the EU mandated target of 15%. We've been comfortably uh, hitting that. Mm -hmm. For example, I'll take Germany because it's uh, stronger usage. They're at around 12.5%, 12% in terms of LDZ. You've got the Netherlands and Belgium, which are higher. Um, so, yeah, we're still seeing demand destruction, but I wouldn't just frame it as demand destruction. I would also frame it as behavioral changes. Mm -hmm. We've seen a shift in how consumers think about their energy usage and I can put myself in that bracket as well as not just myself, friends, family, etc. So yes, there is demand destruction, but for me now it's more about awareness of prices, adjusting your behavior uh, as well as demand destruction. That's the residential industrial sector, still heavy levels. And again, we have a model for that. And we're looking at Germany, it's around 13% at the moment of demand destruction we see in the industrial sector and varying levels in different countries as well. So we see that present in both uh, residential. And, and that's for mainly for gas though, right? Oh, for, I'm only just talking gas, 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 yeah. So yes, if sorry. I turn to you then, uh, to be able to talk about power and, and Germany in particular, um, you know, is some of this demand destruction, as we call it, or, you know, a, a massive fall off in, in, in industrial electricity use, is any of that going to come back? Well, definitely not so quickly, honestly, because um, we are seeing in the industrial sector a few clouds on the horizon and um, big companies are planning to lay off people right now. Um, we saw that, for example, Tesla, which is not, it's a nice example, it's not a big uh, energy consumer in total, but it is a nice example to, to show that. Um, and we are also seeing this in other heavy industry sectors that they at least planning to lay off people. So I think the worst is to come looking into the uh, electricity reduction consumption from the indus industrial sector. Mm -hmm. And this is not due to efficiency, this is due to really less demand and less productivity and less production. 
And would you say then that the threat of relocation or sort of offshoring, as you called it, you called it there in the break, Wayne, is that a real one? Well, it, it is there, honestly. And uh, it's not only driven by energy, it's also driven by, by other factors, uh, general increasing costs, um, general increasing interest rates, what, what we saw there. So refinancing some... some um, uh, loans you had. This is also a, a parameter. So it's not only energy, but maybe it's it's caused by energy. And that's obviously there. You're talking about the some the, the macroeconomic clouds, in, as in a very sticky high inflation, uh, interest rates low historically, but still very high for, for for some industries, and especially, you know, we're not going to be talking about that so much today, but about the for, for renewables and new renewables growth. Now, I'd, li I'd like to turn to to the geopolitics, which was uh, which is the topic of this uh, this uh, this podcast. So, um, Wayne, with Ukraine, Russia, you know, where are we now? We've seen, um, for example, very recently some 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 mighty some serious attacks on their infrastructure, on on our gas storage unit. What what's the impact that that's having? In terms of the impact, we saw a slight uptick in prices with the attack on the storage facilities in, uh, in Western Ukraine. However, if you look at uh, the operator GTSOU, they come out and said that the, the facilities were still working. But what it does, it raises the specter uh, of further attacks as we get closer to the transit deal. And this is something we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks that I wouldn't call it spite. But I would say as we get closer to the end of the year and the expire of the contract, Unfortunately, we could see some further attacks with Russia knowing that, you know, things are not going to go back to how they were. It looks likely there's going to be no interruptible capacity offered at different points. We've seen different quotes. Actually, a lot of people in the market are not 100% sure if we are going to see any redistribution of flows. I think we uh, did a webinar recently and we asked the audience and it's 50, literally 50-50 split. So that uncertainty is still looming. But I think for me, what the, the risk will be is... If they do start targeting it, it's going to, there's about, there's, there's still a couple of BCM of foreign traders gas stored inside Ukraine. So that raises some concerns. But conversely, what it could do, we we're talking about when we get close to filling storages towards the end of this summer season, there was a lot of talk of gas then being sent to Ukraine. So in essence, that could be counter effective and be bearish for the European gas if there's nowhere to put that gas. Because now, the risk premiums, I don't know about the insurance numbers, it's something we want to try and get to the bottom of actually, surely have risen if you're transferring gas from Europe into the Ukraine. And, that, sorry, and as we get closer to this expiry, then I start to fear what might happen. But on, this, on the plus side, as we saw this morning, that huge aid package, 97, 98 billion, split between Taiwan, uh, Ukraine, and of course Israel, I think that's going to enable them to really put more protection on these energy facilities. So perhaps that could counter sort of way the, the threat from Russia. But I still think we haven't heard the last of this story in terms of uh, attacks on infrastructure, especially gas. We've seen the power plants destroyed, but I think gas, they may target more once that relationship ceases. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're talking uh, on Wednesday and the, the aid package was, was ratified uh, early in the early hours on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, if, can you just talk us through the transit deal? I mean, that comes to an end this year. That's the transit deal between Ukraine and Russia. It, it seems slightly odd as well because these two countries are at war but yet they have a transit deal yeah it's something that people always ask why are they still doing it? i think it was beneficial for for both parties but i think as hostilities have continued to say worsen it, over the last few weeks it's certainly um got a bit got a bit stronger in terms of the impact on ukraine's energy infrastructure and the impact on its population in terms of residential areas as well so i think for me that transit deal yeah people are now wondering especially the likes of austria Italy, et cetera, how are they going to get around this? And I think LNG, to some degree, would be the answer. But I still think there might something might still happen in terms of we may still see some of that. But again, looking at the EU's latest stance regarding Russian slash Belarusian gas imports pipeline and LNG and recent statements from GTSOU, it's looking less likely uh, as, we, as we move closer to the end of the year. But our view is there'll be no uh, renewing of this transit And the deal. GTSU, that's the Ukrainian uh, Correct. transit, uh, Correct. gas transit Correct. operator. Uh, Tobias, if I can ask you, you know, so what are your expectations from the 1st of January next year? Is, will we see, will, 
Russian pipeline gas out of the system completely? Well, I think so. Um, if the uh, contract will not be continued, which is a quite old one, honestly, so it, it was over years, uh, we won't have any Russian guideline, uh, pipeline gas out of the Ukraine. Maybe in other flows could be well possible. But uh, this deal will be finished, I'm quite sure. It will not be continued. Um, so the transit flow out of Ukraine will be zero then. Would you expect Russia to also you know, attack some of the pipeline system or within, within Ukraine? Could well be, but I think it's a difficult target. Mm. Um, honestly, a pipeline, either it's, uh, if it's on a surface, it's not quite big. It's only a few things, but most of them are not on the surface. They are below Earth, so hitting them. It's difficult, and when you look into pumping stations, that might be a target, but it's, I think there are much more worth targets to be hit rather than the pipelines I mean, itself. I mean, the storage it. facilities, for me, is the one. Yeah. Yeah. And these are often traders, not, you know, or you say they're non-Ukrainians who own this storage facility. They call it the, the custom warehouse scheme for, yeah, for foreign traders to deposit gas in Ukraine and be exempt from any sort of tax and any other fees. So foreign companies, that's a way of uh, yeah. helping the Ukrainians, but also in terms of a tightness of supply for Europe that, that can be be uh, pumped into, into continental Europe. Um, so where do we stand then in terms of uh, LNG import regas capacity at the moment, uh, Wayne? I mean, do we have too much of it, do you think? Maybe, maybe I'll say too much. We've never got enough the way the market is going at the moment. We have strong capacity, but again, we, we have to think... From next winter, we're seeing this huge influx, or sorry, ramp up of global production, mm -hmm. US projects coming online. So I think then we're going to be in a very good, but now we do have some spare capacity, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's about attracting that LNG. And as much as we talk about the summer is quite bearish, which it is and from a fundamental perspective, you still need to secure that LNG. You still need to maybe be in some competition with Asia, which is Asia's quite loose at the moment as well. So both markets are in a, in a reasonably good position. But I think the fear for us, and we've, I mentioned this, this, mentioned this is, is what's going to happen this winter. It's quite tight. And for us, the summer's bearish. But as I highlighted earlier, that for me and for us as a, in our team, we look at the risk for the winter. And it's quite clear that if we do have a, a cold winter, and this is in our forecast, we do scenarios and we look at the, the cold, potentials for cold winter, we would enter uh, summer 25 with storages around 27%. Mm -hmm. Think where we were, it's almost half of what we, mm -hmm. more than half, so what we, how we entered this year. So think about the impacts of that. You've got the loss of some German coal capacity as well this winter. Mm -hmm. January, as we just spoke about, you've got the loss of the additional Russian volumes. So for me, yeah, it's, uh, it, we, we, the energy capacity is great. We might need more further along down the line once that huge wave starts coming along. Mm. And how about Germany, Tobias? Does that have enough or should it have more? Or wh where, do, where, do we, where do we stand? Well, um, if you want to play the LNG market really right, you need to have overcapacities uh, because uh, you're, you're, you're like a foam. You have to suck up all the surplus gas coming into the system mm. at very low prices. And um, for my personal opinion, we shouldn't have more and we need more. And again, as Wayne has said, I think we are not ready for two cold winters in a row. Maybe for one, but not for two. Um, so we have to play the LNG market correctly, and this means working with our capacities, which is a little bit difficult, especially when you look into investments into LNG terminals, where you have an average capacity rate, which might be below 50%. Um, but we need that to play the market correctly. But that's not cheap either. Uh, right, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. But uh, what is securities of supply worth? Yeah. And if you compare that, that's never a stranded investment. Mm, absolutely. And what about Russian LNG? Is that going to be out of the picture? Do you think it's going to be? You, can you expect to see the EU happen at EU level or more national level? Well, let's say in, in, on, on a shadow level, <laughs> maybe. I think officially not. But you, you never know. I mean, uh, molecules don't have a tag and a flag on it. You don't know where it really comes from. So it might be some derouting things where, I don't know, India, I, I don't know where. Um, so there will be Russian gas in the system, not on purpose, but maybe by coincidence. Through some backdoor, through some uh, loopholes. Completely agree. Yeah. Completely agree with that. And even people talk about this uh, loss of Russian LNG, but let's, let's just not forget if Europe does, it's not in the position to do it now, by the way. That's why you've seen nothing since the announcement. 
people are quite hesitant to say, oh yeah, we'll ban Russian LNG tomorrow because we know we need it for at least the next year or so. Um, but I think what will happen after that, and again, it's just going to be redistributed into the, into the global LNG system. The flows will go, like you mentioned, towards India, towards China. Some of that gas that would have gone there will come to Europe. So it's still going to be in the system. And like we spoke about, who knows where their molecules that we receive come from? We've seen what's happened in the oil market. We've seen these shadow fleet, they call it. I mean, it's, yeah, <laughs> like you said, there's, it's not like we can air tag gas molecules. No, absolutely. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> good, good, good point. Um, I, I'd like to turn to now um, to the crisis in the Middle East. So, you know, it's obviously it's a total tragedy in human terms, but in terms of the energy um, or energy supplies to Europe, I mean, what... Let's talk a little bit about that because I think um, we've seen in recent weeks there was a real scare uh, and a threat of escalation, but that's kind of eased, has it? Would you say, Wayne? Yes, I certainly would. And I think, again, it's something I spoke about earlier. If you look at how this played out, so, of course, Israel attacked the, the uh, consulate in Syria. Um, then Iran was not to say forced, but Iran decided, right, we're gonna we're gonna respond to this. We're gonna let our people know that we're gonna respond to this. And then of course, and I obviously I find it funny because war isn't funny, but what I find interesting is they launched this huge barrage of drones and missiles. They announced it live on TV. We know these Shahi drones are very slow. So Israel already know where they're coming from, what direction, what sort of time they will arrive, in conjunction with UK, I think, France, America, as these missiles were heading towards Israel, they didn't stand a chance. And I think Iran knew that, so it was kind of symbolic. We saw one missile get through. I think it hit an airfield, but there was no deaths or just a small bit of damage. And then, of course, we saw Israel respond with a few token drones that entered uh, were in Iran, which, again, was shot down. I mean, there's rumors that Israel actually did hit some targets, but we've seen no confirmation of that yet. And again, at the end of that, it's a kind of both... Both sides of sort of, okay, we've satisfied our people's requirements, we're, we're defending our sovereignty, etc. And I don't think either wants to get, at the moment, dragged into a, a larger scale war. But it was quite a shock for the first time ever we saw Iran directly attack Israel from its own soil, which took it to a whole new level. But that escalation, a lot of people expected, and looking at the price curves, the market expected it, has not come to pass. And I think now... Both sides of, can say they've won in some respect. Um, so I don't see, unless something else occurs, I don't see a ramp up to back to those levels and looking at the market, we've seen the sort of reaction to that. But it's still a tinderbox, as I said. Things can change. Geopolitics can move at such a such a rate of knots. We could see some more action this weekend. You just don't know. So. Yeah, I think just to provide the listeners with some context, we were here at the end of um, the German NG Day, uh, where you both gave uh, excellent presentations today. So when you know, with some of these these comments, um, some of these issues were mentioned uh, in in your presentations. But Tobias, I mean, we're talking, uh, you know, okay, de-escalation, but and. But there's often been a mention of the closing of the Strait Homers, and and that could have a dramatic impact, of course. But is it is it likely to happen? Is this a realistic concern? Would you say, Tobias? Well, it depends a little bit on the time frame you're looking at. I think, in a, in a, in a, as Wayne has said, in a short short period, not because the de-escalation somehow was there. Um, we have been expecting either an overt, really huge attack from Israel, but it was a little bit more covert. Um, and uh, in, in the end effect, it was drones against drones, which is a different type of warfare, and there is a little bit of a danger. Um, but um, it was also that Iran was kidnapping one of the container ships connected to Israel in the Strait of Hormuz. Mm -hmm. And of course, that has an impact because compared to the Houthi attacks mm -hmm. in the Red Sea, uh, shipping routes could be deviated around the, the Cape of Good Hope instead of using the Suez Canal, so that would increase cost, but it would not decrease volumes in total. But looking into the Strait of Hormuz, there we are having uh, the potential impact of decreasing energy supply, which is primarily oil, but looking into Germany, which is natural gas, uh, LNG from Qatar. Um, so if that would have been blocked, then we would have an issue, not only Europe, but all of the world. And the American capacities, as far as I can see, are not that big to compensate that right now. No, absolutely. So that's, uh, that is still a concern, although given the de-escalation or the not the escalation we, we fear, that hasn't quite happened. Um, and turning to the Red Sea, Wayne, um, 
are LNG vessels likely to resume using that route in the near term? If there's, you know, mm, in, in the current situation? I don't think situation? we're quite ready for that yet. And actually, again, this is another question that needs to be looked into in terms of how is the insurance premiums now traveling through there? It's another question you need to look at. I mean, are they still at elevated rates? But I think in the short term, <laughs> I don't think we're going to see a return to how it was at the moment. But I think over the next few months, if things don't escalate further and we see a quite simmering of the tensions then or some resolution, it seems a bit far-fetched at the moment, then, then, then yes, we're back to normal. But I don't see uh, at that, that happening in the short term. Maybe into the new year, perhaps. And you both mentioned the US, and uh, I'd like to, you know, I think that finally just mentioned there's some key elections happening uh, this year. Um, we'll start off with the one that's happening in November. So the US presidential election. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's it's a bit shocking to think that uh, the, the 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 primary democracy, the you know, the land of the free, has has got you know the only two options are two men in their 80s or near 80s. Um, uh, white men, I should say as well. Uh, um, so what happens? I mean, it looks likely at the moment, although there's a trial ongoing, but it looks likely that Trump will win the presidential election. What kind of, uh, uh, what are the ramifications of that for, 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 for we'll start off with LNG, uh, <laughs> global, uh, global <laughs> supply. <laughs> well, we are both laughing <laughs> because... Um, the thing is that it could be become the worst nightmare, as as you has mentioned today, and uh, Richard, this was really great. Um, Donald Trump is uh, like a hand grenade throwing into the whole geopolitical risks, and we really see that. Looking into LNG, well, we we might have two possibilities. One is gas first for America, because um, having low gas prices means an increase for. Um, their, their economy and their economic growth, um, which also means then less gas for the whole whole world market, and then depends on how we react in, in the Far East. Mm. Might, might well be that we will get a gas shortage in the first step, or it could be the other way around. Yeah, we will sell our gas, but on our terms, which means increasing gas prices. So both ways, I think it's quite likely to have increasing LNG prices for Europe. So, I mean, he's he's a businessman. He doesn't want to you know, cut off his nose to spite his face, does he? Really? Yeah, know. but he wants to earn money. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Selling the same volume at a higher price. But you've mentioned as well before, Wayne, um, uh, about potential tariffs with, with China that could come into play. How how do you see that? Well, like playing I said, out? as I mentioned earlier, I think it's literally a hand grenade into the sort of global geopolitical situation at the moment, and I think. Nothing's off the table, and that's what's concerned. And I think when Trump was last in power, I was, I was in my previous role trading, and I used to have his Twitter feed up on one of my screens because he would say things that even his team wouldn't know about just straight to the world. And some of that was related to oil, for example. He used to move a lot on his comments. Of course, what he did with the, the gas market in terms of, you know, let's just ramp up and export, tear up all of these environmental agreements ramp up production and let's get let's get let's get America and back in business again. So I think you've got that impact as well. But also like Tobias said, you've got the chance of increased prices. But back to the tariffs, of course, I've already seen I mean I have started to watch a few of his rallies now. I'm not a fan by the way, but just to gauge how he how he is and I've heard him mention tariffs and China's still playing us and NATO and I'll stop the He'll walk into office with about 3,000 ideas and no one will know which way he's going to turn next. And that, for me, is the concern. And the one thing I associate with Donald Trump, volatility. And that's all I will say on that in terms of that's what he brings. Unpredictability, volatility, uncertainty, words that traders don't really like. Well, volatility, yes, but just the unpredictability of him and what he can do on any given minute and the, the impact he can have on the global not just the global energy market, but just the global markets in general, because, yeah, some of his ideas are quite uh, off the chart, should I say, compared to your usual politician. I, I would like to add something to that, because we are in a world where when you say, just say words, they suddenly get a meaning and they get an impact. Uh, when, when he spoke about, well, everybody has to con contribute to the 2% NATO tariff, or if not, Russia, you feel free to invade. These are just words, but it's so dangerous. Yeah. And that's something where it could become the worst nightmare. Absolutely. And round the corner, uh, Tobias, are European elections. And we've seen in, in certain uh, European countries, uh, you know, a clawback in, in terms of the, the green transition, in terms of some of the policies that were put in place. 
hasn't so far happened so much in, in Germany. Germany has its other issues, but but do you see that there's a danger there could be a backlash and, and that could come in the next European Parliament? I know you're not um, a regulation specialist, as it were, but uh, it's part of the, the, the political picture here that, that if the Parliament or the formation of the Parliament contains... Uh, you know, maybe not a majority, but certainly a blocking minority of people who are opposed to, to the, these kind of green or uh, environmental policies that could really slow down this energy transition and maybe hinder some of the targets. Well, yeah, could, could well be. Um, if I just can speak for Germany, we see a movement onto the, let's say, extreme wings right and left. And well, what they both have in common is that uh, if you look into the right wing, it's strong nationalism. So why should we? We in Germany, so Germany first. Um, and uh, what both have together, and that's a little bit weird, is that they are, seem to be huge friends with Russia. So if those forces are going to be increased, uh, a maybe agreement with Russia to import gas might be possible if they would be in power, which is quite unlikely. But nevertheless, we do see that the, the majority of the German voters have the tendency to go to the extreme left and right, because with the German government, they only see most of the negative parts, which is at least that's the impression that this current government, to make this energy transition possible, they are forbidding everything. It's forbidden to run a car on a, on a gasoline motor. It's forbidden to heat with natural gas. You have to have a heat pump. You have to have an electric car. And all this forbiddenness really uh, impacts, I think, the, the general mood within Germany. And that might have an impact also on the European Parliament. Because it creates problems in the day-to-day -day life, doesn't it? It puts in obstacles and they have to work, work around, you know, and I think... Expensive obstacles as well, if you're talking like electric cars and the sort as well, so, yeah. And it's uncomfortable. And I mean, you, you change something which is today uncomfortable with something which might be in the future uncomfortable, which is climate change. But I don't see that. Yeah, it's a little bit warmer. So, um, but just saying this uh, ironically, so, so you trade two different things and that makes it really difficult in the storytelling against the general population. And just, just finally, Wayne, <coughs> you, um, India. Is, is, is that, you know, there's an election in India, the world's biggest democracy. The will, will that have any kind of consequence for, for, for energy? Well, I think Modi's going to win by all accounts. So if he does, I don't personally see any change to India's current policies. But of course, if the uh, other side get in, there could be some changes, but I just don't see mm. Modi not winning um, personally. I think um, I think one thing is is certain in all this talk of uncertainty that it's going to be a very very rocky ride and a roller coaster ride in, in in the in the weeks months and probably even years to years to come. So, gentlemen, thank you very much again for being guests on the Montel Weekly. It's always a pleasure, indeed.